What happened to me in McAllen, Texas back in 2019 that was so traumatic that it led me back to that place in 2022 to film the music video for my song, I Don't Know Why You Still Hate Me? This is probably the question that I dread the most because it's very, very complicated. I'm making this video honestly for my own sake. I've been holding a lot of this in for a very, very long time and I've known for a while that the only way I could really truly heal from this and let it go is if I talk about it. And this was the only way I felt like I could sufficiently say my piece about everything that I experienced and so I hope that by the end of this you will get to know me and understand me even maybe. So in October of 2019 I made plans with my best friend at the time I don't even like using that word anymore to go down to McAllen Texas to hang out with him his brother his family and also celebrate my birthday with him and I was supposed to be there from Thursday to Monday. I hadn't seen him in months since he moved back home from Bakersfield California and so I was excited to hang out with my boy and just chill except within 24 hours of my arrival we got into a huge fight at his house and that culminated in him attacking me in front of his mom and me leaving early so what happened well this is the part that makes it all really complex so let's start with the reason why my friend was back in McAllen in the first place this dude had come out to California in 2018 and was living in Bakersfield at his uncle's house where he had hoped he'd be able to pursue a modeling career by making trips out to Los Angeles we connected in November of 2017 and then met in February of 2018 and instantly became best friends. We got really close pretty quickly because we had so much in common from going to the gym to music to fashion to our goals and dreams to our personalities to us being Hispanic and to growing up in a Christian church. He became someone I instantly felt comfortable being around even though he wasn't always easy to deal with all the time but he really did become like a little brother to me. This was the very first friend I had in my life that I knew actually cared about me and had a lot lot of love for me and would express it and show it in a lot of little ways that meant a lot to me. It was probably the easiest friendship I ever had because we were so in tune with each other that the only real complication was his age and his maturity level. But I always had grace towards that because I knew he was a lot younger than me. Even so, he still had this like respect towards me and looked up to me, which meant a lot to me. And I really wanted to be a good example for him to follow. We hung out pretty much every time we had a chance to, even though he lived in Bakersfield at the time and I was in Chino Hills. He would come down and spend the weekends over at my house and we would go to LA and hang out and just do whatever. We would create content, taking pictures of each other for Instagram and social media, film stuff, meet new people. And I involved him in a lot of the things that I was doing with the clothing brand I was working with at the time. Meeting him also came after a time where I had gone through a transition from my former group of friends and there was a lot of church hurt that was associated with that era of my life. So making a friend who was nothing like any of the friends I had before was different and refreshing but I still had a lot of trust issues with people so it was very hard to let him in especially with how fast we bonded like we initially connected because we were both Christian and we loved Jesus and that was one of the main reasons why we even got so close so quickly so what changed the more that we were around the LA and social media influencer culture the more he started wanting to be that it was pretty obvious over time that his relationship with God wasn't ever really real he grew up in a very emotional Christian household that was Christian in tradition you know the mom was a worship singer and he grew up around a lot of that but as what happens in most christian homes the kids get jaded by the performativeness of christianity because it was never really real and so instead of actually getting to know and have a relationship and encounter with god he adopted a lot of that performative christian behavior which when you know god only goes to a certain point before it burns out and then just ends up leading people straight back into the world lost one day he would be super christian claiming to be speaking in tongues saying that someone prophesied over him and that he would be a worship leader and then the next day he would be getting drunk and craving the party lifestyle wanting so badly to be famous and rich he was all over the place and i knew it was because his foundation was never really based on truth and so there were dark moments i had with this kid which felt a lot like wrestling with the devil over him he was pulled in one way and i was trying to pull him in another way and it caused a lot of anxiety and stress for me that i had to step back from being so close to him because of how much of a weight it was on me. But that would lead me to feel guilty because anytime I stepped away, he would do things that would set him back even more. And I had my plans and goals. I wanted to pursue my music career and build my photography business and move up in life. He was caught up in his dreams and aspirations, but never did anything about it because he wanted to live for the vibe and have a good time. And so what happened was that he eventually dropped out of college in Bakersfield, which meant his parents cut him off financially. And then when he wrecked his car twice, he was unable to actually 
actually make his dreams of modeling happen because he could no longer drive out to LA. I was a pretty known fashion photographer in LA at the time who was known by every major top modeling agency in town. He wanted to be a model, so what did I do? I helped him with photo shoots and then I sent his pictures to an agent for new faces at Next Models in Los Angeles and the agent wanted to meet him. And I told him about this, but I told him that he needed to work on his weight and diet before he met with them because I knew that if he met with them, they weren't gonna want to sign him because he is shorter for the average height of a model and he's not as thin as he could be in order for him to really look taller and leaner in photos and for clothes. So I told him, bro, for the next couple of months, like focus on dropping your body fat percentage. And you know what he decided to do instead? He decided to do a 10,000 calorie in one day challenge. I literally set up for him the ability to live out his dream and he didn't even take it seriously because he was so caught up in young adults ministry that the only thing he wanted to do was hang out with his friends and join ministry. But that's how supportive I was of him that I believed him when he said that he wanted to do the things that he wanted to do. When he said, I want to be a YouTuber, I gave him one of my cameras for his birthday for him to start a YouTube channel. When he said, I want to be a model, I hooked him up with a modeling agency, helped him with photos. When he said, I want to be an influencer, I showed him everything I knew about how to grow a following, hitting up people to give him shout outs so he was able to grow his following on Instagram. When he said, I want to be a worship leader, I stood by him. I was like, dope, bro. Like, if that's what God is calling you to be, I'm totally for it. Like, whatever. I didn't care what he did. I was just going to be there for it all. And I just wanted him to actually do something with his life. Towards the end of 2018, early 2019, I noticed a shift in his personality. He was clearly distant from God. And subsequently, it meant that this nice, humble, caring dude I knew was turning into a selfish, arrogant, and judgmental person. And it was this exact thing that made my friends that I would introduce him to, like, not like him. Like, they didn't like his personality because they all thought he was a social climber, he was a clout chaser, and he was arrogant and, like, super smug. In February of 2019, his mom, in my opinion, made the worst decision to throw this kid a lifesaver by saying that if he moved back home to McAllen and went back to college, that she would pay for everything from school to his living expenses to his lifestyle and that he didn't have to work. This was the most stupid thing that any parent could ever do specifically for this type of kid. And I get so mad every time I think about it because it happens so much in the United States among middle class parents who subsequently F up their kids because they're too afraid to let them fall on their asses. And this kid needed to fall on his ass because he grew up being way too privileged. And what she doesn't know and what he doesn't know is that in doing that, she basically told him, I don't believe you're man enough to survive on your own and I don't believe in you. By doing this, she doubted him and it rocked his confidence and it scared him. And so even though I know she did it out of love and out of concern, it was such a bad move because then it made him give up on himself. Even though at that point, you know, he was just working some random job and living just to work and working just to survive. She was right to be concerned for his future because he wasn't doing anything that was going to move him forward in life. But at least he was actually able to survive on his own. We're talking about a kid who had everything handed to him his entire life. I could tell that he honestly never felt like he had any sense of self-accomplishment because his life was so easy. This was a good looking kid who always got people's attention because of his looks. So he never actually had to work hard towards anything most of his life. And so I think he needed this moment for him to see for himself what he's made of without any help. And he was doing it. He was living with roommates and he was able to pay his own bills. I mean, I think for the most part, I think his parents are probably still paying for his car insurance and probably for his phone. But for a 19 year old kid to be able to do that was actually a pretty big deal that I don't even think I ever gave him props for. But as soon as his mom intervened, he took the bait and she enabled him to regress several steps backward. And then before he left, he spent five days in Chino Hills with me at my mom's house on his drive back to Texas. And during these five days, I set up plans with all of my friends to go to the mountains, to hang out in LA and to do all these fun activities because I knew it was gonna be the last time I was gonna see him for a very long time. And during this time, I knew he did not want to go back to McAllen. He was always telling me about how much he hated McAllen and always wanted to leave because he felt like he was meant for so much more. Now the people there were all pretty much doing the same small town things and he never wanted to be a part of it. So even though when he initially told me about the proposition his parents made and was like, it's gonna be awesome good. My parents are going to pay for everything. All I have to do is go to college. I knew that he was sad because it was like he was giving up on his dream that he never really had a chance at pursuing. And that week I noticed that whenever we would meet people and then they asked him what he did, he was always so conflicted and would say, uh, I'm, I'm a college student as a way to make himself feel like he was doing something with his life, even though he wasn't really a college student. But there was this like insecurity about what he was doing in his life because nothing was happening in his life. And I hated
hated seeing him feel like he had no other options. And that's when I tried encouraging him by giving him another option. I told him, bro, your parents care about you and they're just concerned that they don't see you doing anything in your life. All you have to do is show your parents that you're serious about what you want to pursue and demonstrate it by taking action. You can go back to Texas, spend the next six months getting a job and saving money. And then you can move back to California in my mom's house with me into our empty room, pay rent, go to junior college, get a job, but at least you can be close enough to LA to still be able to pursue your modeling career. Like you don't have to depend on your parents to do what you want. You can do it on your own. I believed in him when no one else did. This kid's eyes lit up when I presented him a different option. He no longer felt trapped or afraid, but he felt like his story wasn't over. So before he left, we literally sat down and wrote out a plan. And when he got back to McAllen, he was determined to follow that plan. But instinctually, I knew that it was going to be really hard for him to pull this off. See, back in his hometown, among all his friends, they all think he's this cool dude who's good looking and has a lot of followers on social media. And even his brother told me he's like a celebrity here. You know, he would always strategically curate his lifestyle on social media, showing himself looking way cooler than he really was. He always wanted to like present an image, but whatever. He had this incessant need to gain people's approval, which always drove me insane. So I knew he was going to go back and he was more than likely going to get comfortable because everyone in his hometown was going to gas him up and he was going to get even more arrogant than he was becoming. And I knew that all of these people were going to start to influence him to start getting back into clubbing, drinking, partying, and the self-destructive path he was on before coming back to Jesus. That's why the conversation we had before he left my house will always be an eerie foreshadowing to the future. I warned him and said, bro, when you get back there, like be a leader, you lead them and don't follow them. Because if you go down that path, it's going to destroy a friendship. And he told me you would stop being my friend if I went down that path. And I said, no, I wouldn't stop being your friend, but you would stop being mine. Of course, everything I said that would happen happened. He didn't follow the plan. He got back home and I think he started spiraling out of control because in one part he got comfortable to be in a familiar environment, but in another part he hated being there and the way he dealt with it was by self-sabotaging and self-medicating. I mean, any man knows what happens when you take an ambitious though unguided man and you crush his dreams. Like, what does he do? He drowns himself in instant gratification so he can escape the reality that his life is boring and purposeless. His mom unintentionally neutered his masculinity and he started becoming like the losers he tried to escape from. Over the next couple of months that year, I tried as best as I could to be a source of encouragement to him and tried to push him towards his goals and remind him of what was still possible. But he was so comfortable that he didn't want to do anything. He kept making excuse after excuse about not finding a job and it was getting more disappointing to see that he wasn't even and trying and I was going through my own life and issues and this dude got to a point where he was just becoming such a negative influence in my life so I chose to distance myself from him and you have to understand that it was always so hard to make that decision to actually like distance myself from him because whenever he would be in self-sabotage mode like I knew how much I meant to him and the last time this had happened he attributed me distancing myself from him as one of the reasons why he self-sabotaged so I didn't want him to think that by distancing myself from him that he was going to feel alone, but it was also so stressful to watch him hurt himself and make stupid decisions that I didn't know what else to do. And so I pulled out of his life and a few months went by. And when I decided to check up on him, finally, I had seen that he had indeed fallen way deeper into a dark pit. So yeah, I felt guilty. I remember calling him and we had talked about what was going on with him. And he told me everything that was happening in his life and it wasn't good stuff. And I felt conflicted because I felt like I was the only person who could see exactly what he was really struggling with inside because I'd seen it all coming the prior year. Because this kid grew up with a super Christian traditionalist mom who would whoop his ass if he ever did anything bad growing up. Kids that grow up like that tend to hide absolutely everything from their parents. He was really good at hiding things from his mom and he was also good at showing people whatever side of him he wanted them to see, which meant that he would lie to his mom or to his friends if it maintained a certain image. Like back in California, he lied to his friends back in McAllen, Texas when he dropped out of college and he made them all think that he was still enrolled in college and I knew that because he did it right in front of me. He was talking on the phone with them saying yeah I'm still in college because he was ashamed that he dropped out of college and I was like bro why are you lying to your friends like why don't you just be honest and stuff but he just had this insecurity and he cared so much about how people perceived him and the only person he wasn't good at hiding things from was me. Like I could always see what was going on with him even when he couldn't and that wasn't just because of the nature of our friendship but that was because that's how I am with everyone in my life. Like I, I see people people, I knew what was up. So now I felt like, okay, like I know my little bro is going through something that is making him act out in a certain
certain way that is starting to have actual real life repercussions. So what do I do? Every single time I was in a situation where I didn't really know how to like deal with him, like I was reminded about this promise I made to him where I promised never to give up on him and it was so hard. Anyway, my protector instincts came up and I felt like, okay, based on our history, I know anytime I show up, like this kid lights up when he opens up to me and I can speak life into him and he hears me out and he leaves encouraged. And so maybe I got to pay him a visit down to McAllen so he can remember what is possible and I can help him overcome this dark moment, just like I've always have. So I told him about the idea and I was like, I want to come down and hang out and what do you think? And he was down. So we planned it out that I would come down in October of 2019. During this time period, I was also dealing with my own crap. I was drowning in debt to invest in my music career. I was driving for Uber, which I hated. My photography business was going nowhere and I was having problems with my mom and I was stressed out and my spirit was basically dying. Being able to hang out with him was the refresher I was looking forward to. So I was excited to see my homie who I hadn't seen in such a long time, especially because it was a way for me to escape my own problems. It was clear that me being in his life was a positive influence because as soon as we had the initial call where I was like, what's going on? And he opened up to me. He said he was going to try to get back on track. I remember I encouraged him to talk to his mom. You know, I was like, hey, maybe you should tell your mom about what's going on with you so she could help you with what you're struggling with. Basically for like the first time in our friendship, I felt like I crossed the line with him, but it was like very, very subtle. I don't even really remember what he said, but I knew that he was angered by me even making that suggestion. Like the feeling that I got was, I know you're trying to help me, but telling me to tell my mom what's going on with me is like the stupidest thing that you can say. Like it was a small moment, nothing came of it, but it was really indicative of what was eventually going to happen. A couple of days later, he added me back to his close friends list story on Instagram and posted on his story that he was going to go the next 30 days sober. I guess he initially took me off of his close friends because he didn't want me to see the things that he was doing. Our friend Alex told me one time that he told him, don't tell Brandon what I'm doing, please. I don't want him to get mad or something like that. And I think about that sometimes now years later, because I'm just like, what did I do throughout our friendship to make this kid so fearful of my reaction to his lifestyle choices? I don't know. Maybe I took on too much of a fatherly role or something because currently in my life, I cannot picture anyone saying anything like that about me, but that's also probably because I literally just do not care about anyone anymore. <laughs> but on this call, he basically expressed to me a crisis of faith he was having, which honestly wasn't a shocker to me. He kept doubting his relationship with God. And it was because his perception of God and the church were so skewed because of these performative, emotional Christians he grew up around. You know, this cancer that plagues the Christian church in America that is overly legalistic, hyper spiritual and emotional was a massive factor into his crisis. I could tell that whenever he would bounce back and forth from the church to the world, it was because he had a false understanding of God. He thought the Christian walk was boring and walking in the world was fun. And it was so crazy because I was the example of what it looked like to be neither the church group he grew up around nor the influencer culture he wanted to be like. I was walking with God and my faith made my life like super exciting. And he knew that because he was always around me and we always had like the coolest, funnest times. Like not even just like with what we did taking pictures, but also when we interacted with people and like the life changing conversations we would have and how it impacted people's lives when they were around us. So I couldn't understand why he didn't want to follow my example. And another thing he told me during this call that is like a key detail in this whole story was Brandon, you're the only friend who actually cares about me. Like you actually care about my soul and salvation. And I think that's what made our friendship so unique, you know, because you can have close friends and friends that say they care about you, but to know that your friend cares about your salvation, where you go when you die, like that's a whole other level of friendship. And that in my opinion is real love. So for him to see that and, and feel that meant that he knew how much I cared about him. But as the trip got closer, he started acting really strange and hostile towards me. He would reply to my stories on Instagram saying everything I was doing was cringe and making fun of me for trying to promote my music on TikTok. And let me give you an example of how weird this kid was behaving. So he would always make fun of me for throwing up peace signs in my photos, right? Saying that's cringe. And so to have him like judge me for it was so annoying. Cause I'm like, dude, you're not cool just because you don't throw up the peace signs in photos. Like anyway, a few weeks before I was supposed to come down and visit, he posted a picture on Instagram and what is this fool doing in his picture? He's throwing up a peace sign doing exactly what I would do. So of course I left a comment and said something like, I thought you said the peace sign wasn't cool or cringe or something like that. Instead of just acknowledging how stupid he was for making a big deal about me throwing up the peace sign, he deletes my comment and doesn't even acknowledge the hypocrisy. Like it was weird, <laughs> but whatever. I didn't read too much into his behavior. I pretty much always just justified the weird things he did because of him being younger than me and just more immature. Oh, but there was another incident when I would send him viral TikToks of these funny things that these 
other homies would do and I was always like hey we should do like a TikTok playing music because you play the guitar and I sing and we can do something for TikTok and his response to me was like I'm gonna pretend like you didn't just ask me to do that like that's how arrogant he got like this kid was out of his mind oh and not to mention too that around May of 2019 when he was back at home in McAllen I kept telling him bro get on TikTok you can pop off on TikTok all these guys are doing it and you have a good look you can build your Instagram following get on TikTok he was getting depressed because his Instagram following wasn't growing and he couldn't figure out what to do and what I told him if you get on TikTok you can grow your Instagram following and if you grow your following on TikTok and on Instagram you can get signed to a modeling agency and come back to LA and you know what he said he said I would never go on TikTok everyone here would laugh at me if I went on TikTok that is so cringe and I'm not gonna do that he made it seem so beneath him again all because of what people around him were gonna think at this point back in LA I had already released my first three songs I was focused on building my fan base for my music career and creating content for Instagram and YouTube with some friends of mine I was hustling to make my dream happen and I think it's fair to say that he was envious of that and was projecting his own failures onto me via social media I mean it makes sense he made what I consider to be one of the worst decisions of his life by going back home where he had to give up his dream and then he was watching his big bro live the life in LA he still never really even got to have so that's how I read a lot of the interactions we had before I arrived to McAllen you know we had different personalities when it came to our work ethic and life choices you know like I would say I would want to do something and I do it and he say he'd want to do something and never do it and the further away he got from God the more insecure he would become and so of course I was always going to be the target of his own insecurities where he'd envy me the one person who tried to help him so there was something there brewing that I didn't really know the complexity of because again I was just excited to hang out with my bro and escape my current reality in LA I had it all mapped out in my head I was going to be there for five days I was looking forward to hanging out with his family getting to know his friends and literally chilling if you know me I could literally just sit on a couch all day but if I'm with my favorite people ever then I literally don't need to do absolutely anything and that's what I was hoping we would just do to do nothing with my bro and just feel so much at peace I had no expectations other than assuming we'd probably take some pictures go to the gym and just like do whatever I figured he had more of a plan of things that we can do to hang out you know since that was his hometown but my plan was I'm just gonna have fun with him for the first four days try to see where his head's at with his life and remind him of what's possible for his life then on the last day I would actually directly confront him about everything that's been going on with him and have a deep talk so what could possibly go wrong right so I arrive on October 17th he picks me up from the airport in McAllen and I immediately get a sense that something was off every time I had ever seen this kid when he would come down to my house he would always be so excited to see me and stuff and so like seeing how he was like still in the car wearing sunglasses didn't get out to greet me or anything until like I gestured him I felt like that was all completely out of character for him so I knew something was up so I got in the car and I remember the first thing he said was like I almost forgot to pick you up and I was like oh okay what were you doing because you know that's the first thing you tell someone when you pick them up after not seeing them for a long time and he said that he slept in because he had gotten high the night before and from my perspective him going from like I'm gonna try to be sober and get my life together to uh, I almost forgot to pick you up because I got high last night and slept in like this was someone that never smoked weed before and this was the first time they were just like dropping this information on me so you know I'm like well, how am I supposed to react like oh okay no in this context it's more like whoa bro are you okay like you're doing something that you like never did before and you were always against so you know this wasn't just something to take lightly then in the car ride we were talking and I could tell he was resistant towards me and super guarded and I didn't know what was up exactly so I remember asking him like if everything was good he was like yeah but he was just telling me about all of these experiences he's been having going to the ACL music festival and being around people who were doing drugs and how he dropped his English class and acting so smug because his mom didn't know and I was just like whoa dude like he just kept dropping these bombs of information and like saying all these things that again in this context were really reflective of some troubling dark stuff right because I'm here thinking like your mom offered to pay for your entire lifestyle so you can go to college get your education so you can make something of your life and here you are revealing the stupidity of your choices telling me that you dropped your English class because you were busy getting high and again this was like my internal monologue like these were the thoughts that I was having and I wasn't like saying anything out loud because I wasn't trying to create some sort of confrontation or tension and so throughout the entire time I was in the car 
car. I was just trying, you know, not to react, trying to be chill and cool. But it also felt like he was trying to get me to react to it. And then it started triggering my anxiety because at this point with how he was acting, I was like, I don't even recognize this kid anymore. Like his entire demeanor and energy was so different. And it was like, he didn't want me to be there. So I instantly felt like I'd made the worst mistake ever by coming down. So I tried to suppress my anxiety and he was like, you know, what do you want to do? And I was just like, well, I just had a long flight. It would be cool to just chill at your house and catch up. And he like resisted that idea. So he was just like, no, let's just go to the mall and it's right around the corner and we could just, you know, walk around. So we went to the La Plaza mall and walked around for maybe about like less than 30 minutes. And it was so awkward. And I was like, you know, how's your family doing? And he would just like give me one worded answers. And it was just like so disconnected. Like I didn't know how to talk to him. He didn't know how to talk to me. And at this point I was getting frustrated because I'm like, bro, like how are you going to be treating me this way? Like I'm here to visit you. Like you're supposed to be my homie. Like, I felt so uncomfortable. Like I didn't know what to do, but I kept pushing these feelings down because I'm like, it probably has to do with the big elephant in the room. And I'm like, I don't know how to avoid addressing his behavior and not talking about what I know is going on, especially because I didn't want to talk about it this early into the whole entire trip. So I was just like put in a really weird position and I didn't know what to do. And what caused me more anxiety was not knowing how I was going to get through the next couple of days because I'm like, bro, I can't even talk to you. Like it's so awkward and like we're not connecting. Like there's something that's just not working here. So how am I going to be inside your house? Oh my God, it was torturous. When we got back into the car, I was pretty much forced to confront him and be like, yo, what is going on with you? You're acting totally different. This is totally out of character for you. Like what's up? And he just immediately like shut me down. He did not want to acknowledge his shift in personality and was like, I'm not different. I haven't changed. This is who I am. And you just need to know the real me and accept me. And I was like, bro, you've changed since you got back here. Even the way you talk is different. Like you all of a sudden have some like weird accent. And he was like, you don't know me. The people here know me. He was acting hostile where he was resisting me, where he was trying to deflect and all these things. And I'm just like caught because I'm like, bro, like, what do I do? Like, I'm only bringing this up because you're treating me differently. Like what I couldn't get through to him, it was nothing like any type of conversation I ever had before. He put up such a guard and resistance. And I was honestly really shocked because I'm like, bro, it's, it's me. Like I'm always able to penetrate through this kid and I just wasn't able to. And so that ramped up my anxiety because I'm just like, dude, like, I don't know what to do now at this point with this kid. I know what this is about. I know why you're acting like this and why you're acting hostile towards me, but I couldn't even express or speak about that because he would just shut me down. And it caused me to start shutting down internally. I felt completely trapped. You know, we pulled up to his house and I saw his mom and I had to pretend like everything was normal, even though inside I was dying. And he was on the phone the entire time when he was around me. He was just like not engaged with me, disconnected, like kind of like I was a burden to him. And then I'm just like, well, why did you agree to this if this is how you're gonna treat me? Like it was so off-putting, so messed up. He didn't bother to set up the guest room and he was acting like he just didn't want me there. And I guess I would ask you like, what would you do if you were in my shoes? Like you can't talk to this person because they'll deny that they're acting different. So what? I even tried to fake it just to be civil, but I couldn't even speak. Like that's when people don't know what happens when anxiety overtakes your body. Like my motor skills started shutting down. I couldn't speak full sentences. And then when we went from the house to go play basketball with his little brother and his little brother's friends, I was just completely out of my mind at that point. Like this is exactly what anxiety does. I'm just like trying to run away in my mind. I'm stuck in the middle of nowhere with someone I don't even know. I have to fake my way throughout this entire weekend where this person doesn't even want me here in their home. And I was just like completely out of it while we were playing. And the worst part is to experience this in front of other people because of course I'm going to look weird. Like they're thinking, why is Brandon acting like that? Like he's not talking, he's disengaged. He's like antisocial, especially because that's not how people know me, right? And they don't know what's going on in my mind and like all the thoughts I'm processing. Like it was just such a shitty position to put me in. And it sucked because it made me look bad. After we finished playing basketball, we went off-roading in the car and me and my friend were the only adults and it was his little brother and his 16 year old high school friends driving and everyone was passing around vapes and my friend was passing back and forth vapes with his little brother and he knew because I sang and because of previous incidents that I hated being around vape. Then his little brother's friends were asking me about what I did and I told them that I'm a music artist and they kept asking me about my music and they were all super intrigued and I told them how I was working with producers and how I spent like $11,000 on an EP and all that and they thought it was all cool and they were hyping me up. Meanwhile, my friend was quiet the entire time and would always make fun of my song Fantasia a lot. But once their friends thought I was cool for what I did, of course, 
first they were like switching up. Then after we got back to his house around like nine o'clock, I told him I'm gonna go for a walk around the neighborhood, peace out. And then I left to have like a full fledged anxiety attack. I didn't wanna be there. You know, I was confused. I was mad because of how this person was treating me. And then an hour later, he kept calling my phone and I didn't wanna talk to him. And I was like, what the heck do I do? How do I get myself out of the situation? I was so ashamed of myself for coming down there. I felt embarrassed and humiliated. And then eventually I answered and he was like, we've been driving around looking for you, where are you? Like the fact that it wasn't weird to have your friend who hours earlier just flew into town, dip out at 9 p.m. to go on a walk in your neighborhood that he's never been to. In hindsight, the fact that that didn't signal something was wrong, like maybe your friend is having some sort of a meltdown, shows me how much this person just did not give a crap about me. And the craziest part is that I had an anxiety attack in front of him one time, but I think he was just too like inept to even be able to really detect that. Like he just lacked so much life experience where he just would never be able to tell what someone looks like when they're having an anxiety attack or when they're shifting. Like if someone I was close with came into town and was staying with me and on the first night they felt the need to go on a walk around my neighborhood, like I would be so concerned and say like, are you okay? Can I come with you? Like that's what normal friends do. I didn't understand what was going on inside of me. You know, I was dealing with anxiety and this was also like controlling my mind. And so my survival instincts were kicking in and I just wanted to run away. But I told him to meet me at the gas station and he picked me up with his little brother and a girl who came down that weekend that I guess he was talking to, but he thought nothing of it. When we got back to his house, him, his brother and the girl went to hang out in the room and I just went straight to bed because I didn't want to be around him. I couldn't sleep at all that night because I had no idea what to do. This wasn't going at all like I expected. I just kept thinking like, if he didn't want me to come down, then why did he agree to all of this? Like, what the hell? And I was like, man, like either way, no matter what I do, I'm going to look like the dramatic, crazy person in the situation. Like if I leave early, his mom and his brother are going to all wonder what happened and why. And then he's going to act like he doesn't know what's going on or like he isn't treating me any differently. And then I'm going to look like I'm making a big deal out of nothing. And if I stay, I don't know how to interact with him when he kept acting like everything was fine, even though he was making me feel unwelcome and doing disrespectful gestures. On top of that, I suspected that the whole reason why he was treating me differently was because he knew that I knew what was going on with him. And I knew that no one around him knew that because he presented a different image to everyone. To his mom, he was a golden child who was doing what she wants by going to college. And to his friends, he was this cool party dude who had a following on social media. And to his little brother, he was a hero that he looked up to. And to me, he couldn't make up an image because he knew that I saw the real him. A kid that was completely lost. Who's basically trying to like pit me in a corner and unveil all this crap he was doing and was saying like, you have to accept me as this. And this is who I am. I'm not the Christian kid you once knew. I'm this person. My real friends accept me. So you have to too. But from my perspective, it wasn't about who he was or wasn't. It was more like, I know you're lost, confused and scared about your life. And I'm just here to help you figure it out. That was all I was trying to do, but it felt like he was taking out all of his self hate onto me. I think it didn't help for him to know deep down inside that I was right about everything I warned him that would happen if he were to have wavered onto this particular path. He had absolutely nothing going for him in life. He was merely an illusion to the people around him. And I think me being there made him extremely vulnerable because I knew the truth. So it was no wonder why he was acting extremely hostile towards me, especially because I knew that the choices he'd been making were going to have lasting consequences like him failing his classes, getting fired from work and getting involved in drugs and then getting his little brother involved in them too. He was spiraling out of control and I was the only one who could see it. And that put me in a really tough position. And so at that point, there was nothing left I could do. I was so overly confident that I could go down there, hang out with my bro and then talk to him and help him straighten it all out. But I had no idea it had gotten this bad for him to be treating me the way he was because it was completely out of character for him. I was struggling because I was like, you know, what is the right thing to do in this scenario? Like this kid clearly needs help, but I can't help him. The only person who can help him is his mom. But what do I do? Pull her aside and tell her what's going on. That would end my friendship with him in an instant. And like, I didn't want to lose my friend. That was the whole point of trying to help him and be there for him all of this time. But at the same time, I didn't know what to do. Because for me, if I left and did nothing, something worse could happen. You know, this is someone who got into two car wrecks when he was in California that I had to help him through. And then there were some other sketchy situations he put himself in where I'm like, this kid could die from the stupid situations he puts himself in. Like imagining his mom being like, you knew what was going on and you didn't tell me anything about it. Like 
no thank you, I don't want to deal with that. And so in this case, the right thing to do was for me to tell his mom what was going on, to hand over this information I had so she could deal with it because I didn't want to be responsible over it. I knew that it would cost our friendship, but I was willing to make that sacrifice if it meant him getting the help he needed in the long run because again, this is what you do when you are a protector. Protecting the people you love means diving over a grenade and sacrificing yourself. But I had no idea how I was going to pull that off and I honestly didn't really even want to. So I told myself that I tried to talk to him again in the morning at least one last time. So the morning came, I woke up around like six in the morning. He didn't wake up until like 1130 or so and I was already in a bad mood because I tried waking him up twice or three times and he wasn't waking up. So I was like, dude, this is so awkward being here. Like I have nothing to do and this kid is sleeping still. And you gotta understand, when you compare the experience of how it was whenever he came down to Chino Hills to stay at my house, like it was the complete opposite of how he was. I was still so hospitable considering I did not like bringing friends over my house because of my mom. Like I didn't want anyone around my mom. But every day when he was over, something was planned and we'd always do something fun and cool. So for me to be in his place and he wasn't being welcoming and he didn't know what to do with me, it felt just like so uncomfortable. Like my bad that I'm here. I thought no one else was home. So I was chilling on his front porch trying to figure out what the hell I did wrong to find myself in this position. Of course, I was mad at him and hurt by him because I was so excited for this trip and to see how he was acting and treating me caught me so off guard. Like I felt trapped and afraid of the one person that I thought I was gonna feel safe around. When he woke up, he came outside to the porch with coffee and sat down and acted like everything was normal, which made me even more upset. At that point, trying to have like a normal conversation with him was completely thrown out the window because again, I felt hurt. So I remember confronting him in that moment, finally telling him that I didn't wanna be there. I told him that he was a lost cause and that he was super insecure and that's why he was trying to get the approval of everyone around him and that he was becoming a loser. I told him like, how are you gonna take over your dad's oil company when you failed your English classes. <laughs> and it wasn't like what I was saying wasn't true, by the way. Like I just said it and delivered it in a way that came from an angry heart. And then he started attacking me, saying my music was trash, that I'm insecure. And I don't even remember what else he said. But then he proceeded to do something to me that I think was the root of what I would call the actual traumatic moment of this entire like event. I mean, one of, I think like the biggest piece of the trauma was this. I didn't learn about this term until like two years years later when it became a popular term on TikTok. And once I learned about it, I realized this is exactly what I experienced in Texas, but I had no words to describe it. Gaslighting. See, I knew what was going on inside of him that was causing all of this. I knew the way he was treating me was directly connected to it, but he denied that reality. He told me that nothing has changed and that this is who he was. Then he made me out to seem crazy for calling him out on what was obviously so different about him. And the argument that that ensued on the porch. We were both hurling insults and saying hurtful things to each other. I basically accused him of being so insecure and desperate for people's acceptance that he'd been so influenced by his McAllen friends to make poor choices that was making him become a loser and that he was taking it all out on me. And he was trying to defend himself by calling me crazy, saying that he was normal and, and that I'm the one with false expectations and that I'm asking him to treat me like I was his girlfriend. And that's probably like the worst thing you can say to another man. It was a complete rewriting of the truth. But I didn't know how to combat gaslighting like this because I couldn't identify what this tactic even was. But that ended up affecting me so hardcore because I didn't understand what was happening. I mean, I guess my mom had always gaslighted us growing up, but I guess I never expected it to come from him, you know, like changing the reality of something, especially me being a problem solver, you know, that is like integral to my personality to solve problems. And so for me, to know and identify a problem that was going on that was causing everything. And then to be told that that problem does not exist. And that in fact, I'm just crazy. Like that effed up my mind because I didn't know how to combat that. You know, like it made me question myself. Am I crazy? Is it just me? And it caused so much destabilization within my own confidence that never happened to me before in my life. Like when I got back from that experience, my confidence had shut down immensely in a way that never in my life had ever happened, not even from my mom, who is like the destroyer of confidence. When I learned what gaslighting was and what he specifically did, everything made so much sense. And I felt so vindicated because I'm like, I knew that what was happening to me then wasn't normal. It wasn't me acting crazy. It wasn't me expecting things. It was him doing something that was like psychologically up. 
So he ended up going inside and to my surprise, his mom was home. I guess he went to his mom and asked her to make me leave or something. Like next thing I know, his mom opens the door and was like, I wanna talk to you inside. And then I go inside the living room and she's like, I don't know what's going on here, but I think it's best that you leave. And then in that moment, I was like, oh my God. First of all, I was mortified that she had been there and overheard the argument, which by the way, had never ever happened between us before. Like it's never my character to go to someone's house and to cause a fight or an argument. But at the same time, I was put in a really effed up situation where my survival mode kicked in and I reacted off of my own fears. But I felt humiliated that she was gonna now respect me less because of what had just transpired, especially because she wasn't going to understand the full picture of what was really going on. But I was caught in a moment where I'm like, okay, I'm being kicked out of my friend's house by his mom and she probably thinks I'm crazy and doesn't know what is really going on. If I'm going to leave and this is how the friendship ends, I need to at least tell her the truth so she could help him. And so I said something like I'm so sorry this is not normal something deeper is going on here and she was like I heard everything and honestly I had no idea how to like under pressure and quickly convey the complexity of everything that was going on especially because I didn't even know it was being gaslighted you know the only way that I could begin to allude to it was by saying that he's been drinking and getting drunk and that he's changed as a person to which he defended himself saying he's lying I've drank a little bit but he's lying and and she was saying that she knew some of the things that he was doing but she was believing leaving him and here I am caught in a situation where I'm like, how am I being portrayed right now? I don't feel like I was adequately ever able to express what was happening until now. And what I was trying to tell her was that your son is self-sabotaging himself by doing drugs, getting drunk, failing his classes, getting fired from work, having unprotected sex, hanging out with losers and treating me like a piece of all because he's depressed that he had to give up on his dream and now that he's doing nothing with his life he's taking it all out on me and no one knows this but me and that's why he's been so hostile and unwelcoming since i've arrived your son needs help that's what i wish i could have said but obviously i never got to say all that because didn't even know it until now instead i know from their perspective it probably sounded like oh your son is getting drunk what a bad kid look i'm this super holier than thou christian who is passing judgment on your son because he's drinking like that wasn't at all what I was trying to say, but I didn't know how to get her to see the severity of what was transpiring without telling her what he'd actually been hiding from her. And since the drinking wasn't enough, the only other thing I knew to say to her to get her to see that something was wrong was to bring up the fact that he was sharing vapes with his little brother. There was a moment where she was like shutting him down and she was like, Brandon, tell me the truth. Did you see him vape with his little brother? And I was like, yes. And at that point, this dude charged at me across the living room, jumped on me, started pummeling me, hitting me, and his mom was screaming, stop, stop, pulling him off of me. And then he was screaming, he's trying to destroy our family. And just, he went completely unhinged. Then he ran into the guest room where I was staying and he grabbed all of my stuff and he was like throwing my clothes out of the room. And then he was screaming like, get out. It was absolutely wild. Seeing him turn into this monster was absolutely unnerving. Of course, in the moment, I didn't react to it because I've already been accustomed to insane behavior like this from my family but I really couldn't believe what I was witnessing. After that, he ran back into his room and shut the door and proceeded to block me on everything. His mom then took me to the airport. In the car ride, I tried to again explain what was happening. And this time I told her a lot of other information I knew so I could transfer the responsibility of it to her. I don't even know if she understood what my intention was or if she thought that I was just saying this to get back at him for our argument or whatever. Honestly, I have no idea. And then I got to the airport and had to call my mom to tell her I was coming home and that I had a falling out with my friend and all of that. Later that evening when I returned, I saw that his little brother had sent me a voice note on Instagram to which I saw, but I never listened to. And I could only imagine how angry he was at me also, you know, I'm guessing once he got home later on, his mom, I don't know, they probably had some sort of family situation and they probably both got in trouble. And then of course I'm the one that's to blame because I'm the one who ratted them out. So that's what actually happened to me in McAllen, Texas. When I got back home, I told no one about what had happened. The only person who knew was my mom. After that day, something inside of me just died. I couldn't believe what had happened and I blamed myself for so much even though I knew it wasn't entirely my fault. In December of 2019, I filmed a private video to send to him. You know, because I felt like his interpretation of the events were that I told his mom everything that had happened to hurt him because of the argument that occurred or because I was upset by not being treated a certain way. And if that's what he believed, then sure, of course, I'll look like the bad guy from his perspective, but that wasn't the truth. And honestly, I don't think the truth 
truth would have made any difference from his perspective because he probably wouldn't have wanted me to tell his mom anything in the first place regardless but that's what he doesn't understand yet the choices you make as an adult are way more complicated than they are when you're a kid when you know more you're held to a higher level of responsibility and you think he'd know that considering he's the older brother of his two siblings but he never learned to be a leader only a follower which is why he never understood me so i was trying to talk to him about it to make peace with the situation because i knew he hated me for what i did but i wanted to explain that i did what i had to do to look out for him because i promised him that i would but it didn't really matter i remember putting the video on youtube under unlisted and sending it to him through my headshot instagram and i assumed he blocked my number since he blocked me on everything else i remember waiting every single day for about like two weeks to see if the view count would go up because he was the only one that had that link so any view count would be from him and i was like hoping that he had clicked on it and watched but he never did he more than likely saw my message and deleted it but during this time guess what happened he got on tiktok and then blew up on tiktok and so i knew this was going to magnify his arrogance and make him think that he was an even bigger legend than he previously thought he was this was probably the worst thing that could happen to someone in his situation but at the same time i could not help to feel like bro i told you so can you imagine if he would have listened to me originally and the only reason why i even knew about that was because when i went to go send him the video i went on his instagram and i saw this follower count went up and he had a link to tiktok in his profile saying go follow me or whatever people were doing at that time and so i was like oh he popped off on tiktok but i never actually went on or saw anything of his on tiktok then in 2020 i released my music video for too late our mutual friend alex was playing one of the lead roles in the video and he basically played me and then my friend antonio played him and this video was like a dramatization of our friendship obviously like it was not exactly the same situation i put it out there and it impacted so many people who came across it and then about a month later i released the backstory video on too late where i explained why i released the video and that was basically the last time i talked about the situation publicly and then of course the world changed a week later after i released the backstory video the pandemic started and we were all locked in i think i had hoped that during this time like he would have compassion and just like i don't know feel like the world is going to hell maybe i should fix this situation with this person i used to be close with but nope <laughs> I'm not sure how soon after I released the backstory video, I decided to do this, but in order for me to be able to get closure and move on, I needed to know that this kid knew that the backstory video existed. I didn't need to know that he had watched it, but I need to know that he at least knew it existed because in my mind, I wanted him to at least have the ability to know the truth about what actually happened and why I actually did what I did. At that point, because I knew he had blocked me on everything, the only way that I could reach him to ensure that he saw this video link was via email. But the way that I work and do things is I shoot for a 100% success rate. And my objective was that I needed him to know that this video existed, right? So I opted to do what I call my nuclear option, which was I had about 100 of my fans or so all email him a link to the video that said, please watch this. I also think I texted him from a fan phone I had at the time, but that wasn't good enough for me because I didn't know if he had the same number or if he changed his number like again i needed a hundred percent success rate and i didn't want to have any reason to doubt that he never got the message so the email approach was the only way i knew he would know I honestly didn't even think about what this would look like from his perspective until like may of this year i was like how would i feel if my inbox blew up from a bunch of random people who emailed me a link to a video of my former best friend talking about the backstory of a music video they made about our friendship <laughs> I'd probably feel like he was talking about me to all of his followers or something. But I honestly didn't even think about that because from my perspective, like none of these people even knew who they were emailing. I literally posted on my story a poll that said, yes or no, I need help. And everyone that said yes, I just asked them, hey, can you email this email address, this link and say, please watch this. And that's all I did. And I sent that to everyone who messaged me back and they all did it. Plus during that time, I was doing the same thing to get in front of journalists so that they could write an article about the song too late. I never exposed this person's identity or name ever. Like I never had any intention to, but from his perspective, I guess it could appear like I was talking about him or whatever. I had my 100% success rate because that same evening he had his brother and cousins leave hate comments all over that video. So I guess the video didn't have much of an influence on him at all. And it was clear he still hated me based on the comments that they were leaving me. So there was nothing more I could do from there. So that was it. I continued on with my life, just trying to get through the pandemic 
the way everyone else was and, and eventually released another song later that year called Goodbye. And throughout this whole time though, it was so hard for me to forget about everything. You know, there were so many different emotions I had to process. Like in one part, I felt like my friend died. Another part of me felt like I died and I stopped being the person I normally was. Then another part felt like there was this injustice that this person caused in my life and that it was just not fair. To process these feelings alone was hard. They resulted in me having a lot of dreams that he was in where we would be out with my friends and I'd see him and I'm trying desperately to reach him, to try to talk to him, but he would be so resistant and he would reject me and he would like turn away from me and it caused so much turmoil within me. Because for me, I didn't have peace because I felt like he had a twisted perception of why I did what I did and it haunted me. I felt like I needed to clear that up because in my mind, I'm thinking like, how can you hate me for being the friend you knew I would be? Like, especially all of this time later when I was right. It sucked because I'm thinking like, bro, you created a version of me in your head to make it easier to hate me instead of being able to see the real me who was the person you always loved being around. And I really, really missed my friend, but it was like he was dead. And it felt like worse than death, you know? Like at least when someone dies, you can celebrate their life and hold on to the memories of them. But in this case, this person died and the memories were all tainted. It was just really twisted. And so that's why I did everything I could to block it out of my mind in my memory and why I never really wanted to talk about it to anybody. So I moved on as best as I could, but deep down there was always this sadness that I could never escape from because there was just this one thing with this person that I was never able to fix or resolve. There was an instance where I had a dream like this and I woke up incredibly emotional and it was the same kind of dream where I was trying to talk to him and tell him what I'd been wanting to tell him and, and he wouldn't allow me to and it crushed me. I don't remember when it was, but I knew it happened sometime in 2020, but I remember waking up in the middle of the night texting him and the craziest part was that because I believe like he had blocked me, like I never thought that he would ever see that text message. And I guess what that was for me was like, you know how when someone loses someone and they want so desperately to be able to talk to them. So they text their phone, even though they're not gonna respond or they listen to a voicemail. Or they're looking for something to connect with this person that they lost. That's what this was. And it's just so embarrassing now because I don't think he ever changed his number and I don't think he ever blocked me. So I think he did get that text message and I don't remember what I said, but I'm just like, man. <laughs> Towards the latter half of 2020, I decided to restart my Instagram account by moving all of my active and engaged followers from my main account to a new account. I was gonna rebuild from scratch after I realized that my engagement had dropped due to all of these tactics I had been implementing in order to grow my following. Months after my new account was established, I started seeing his username pop up when he would comment on mutual friends of ours posts. And I was like, oh shoot, I forgot that this was gonna be a thing, you know, cause my new account wasn't gonna be blocked. And so I actually had to mute that friend because I was like, I don't want to see this person's name at all. Like, I just don't want to know that they exist. In order for me to actually like allow myself to grieve this loss, I had to literally tell myself that this person died. And I think that was like the biggest struggle that I dealt with in the aftermath was being able to grieve. I never opened up about that to anyone because no one would understand. Most of what transpired after March of 2020 was me processing the trauma and learning a lot from it. The first thing that was addressed was my anxiety and where it came from. And this led me down a path where I eventually understood that I was abused growing up by my mom and that I developed anxiety because of the household I grew up in with constant arguments and fighting. There was always so much tension and I never wanted to be home. So I developed anxiety that oddly enough didn't even start manifesting itself until my 20s. But what I learned was what triggered my anxiety. Whenever I didn't feel emotionally safe, like something bad was going to happen where my heart was going to get hurt. The anxiety was like the natural reflex of receiving the hit much like flinching is to someone about to punch you. It was never an actual fear of physically being hurt. It was something psychological and it stemmed from all of those years my mom would abuse us you know by yelling at us, calling us stupid, saying the worst things to hurt us, to put us down, hitting us and you know it was a learned reaction to my environment and I never 
never felt like it was a big issue until it affected me down in McAllen. When I was in McAllen and everything was happening, the way that he was treating me was giving me the indication that he didn't want me there and he was basically rejecting me. And so naturally my anxiety kicked in to brace for the impact for the moment he was actually going to say it or the action that would actually prove it. And so it severely affected my ability to reason, function, and communicate. And I think that's why over time I became less critical on myself with how things went down because could they've been handled better by the both of us? Sure, but I was dealing with a mental debilitating setback while trying my best to still be the friend I promised I'd be. So I think under the circumstances, I handled it as best as any broken person could. Over the years, I have often thought about the way things could have been handled differently. You know, he was a very incredibly sensitive kid. You know, his mom and my mom were complete opposites. His mom showered him with affection and words of affirmation, and my mom withheld affection and destroyed us with words. My natural instinct was to hurt back when I was hurt that morning when we were arguing on the porch. And sometimes I wish I could have tried a different approach. I wish I could have built him up, spoke with love and grace, especially because I knew that that's how he received affection and love. But I didn't know how in that moment because I was clouded with my anxiety. This is what I wish I would have said in that moment on the porch that morning. Hey bro, I just wanna let you know that I love you and I'm concerned about you. I know you said that this is who you are and you're not different, so I'll accept that. But I just wanna let you know that I think the world of you and I think that you're destined for so much greatness. And I just wanna remind you about the reasons why I think you're so cool to me. I think you're so talented, you know, you could play the guitar in ways I wish I could and you have an ear for music. I think you're creative and the way that you approach and build your aesthetic, I think is so dope. I think you're funny and I love talking to you about anything. I think you're actually really smart and when you put your mind to something, you do really well at it. I think you're a really loving, caring and good person who is an incredibly good listener. You'll never tell me what I want to hear and you'll always be honest with me, which I appreciate so much. And you have this like zeal and energy that is so contagious and it makes people want to be around you. Bro, you're so special and I wish you could see yourself from my eyes, but I feel like you're going through something dark and it's hurting you, bro. And it's hard for me to watch and not be able to do anything to help you. I promised you that I was gonna be there for you during times like this. That's why I flew down from LA just to come and see you. That's how important you are to me. So please don't shut me down. Talk to me and tell me how I can help you. That's what I wish I could have said, but I didn't know how. I was crippled by my own fears and anxiety. You know, I was just trying to survive because that's what I had to do my whole life. I think maybe that if I said that to him, things would have been much different and maybe none of this would have ever happened. And for that, I'm sorry. That year I got close with my cousins and through connecting and bonding with them is what showed me what was missing in my life that this kid had filled and what made losing him really, really hard. My cousins were so affectionate and most of my life I thought I hated affection. You know, I never wanted a hug or to touch anyone in my family and I thought I was just an unaffectionate person. But then when it came to my cousins and even with this kid, I noticed that I was actually really affectionate. But I had learned that my trust among my family had been so broken that it was the reason why I rejected their affection. My relationship with my cousins revealed to me that I never felt like I ever had a real family. And this emptiness inside of me was because I felt like I never belonged anywhere. I didn't have a home and I didn't have a family. I mean, technically I did, but it never felt that way. And so when this kid came into my life, we like adopted each other and it gave me the first glimpse of that. Having this kid in my life during that time period was one of the greatest gifts God could have ever given me. And it was why it was so hard to let it go. But luckily in the aftermath, I was able to find a new family through my extended family. And my cousins and nephews filled that void that had been left behind. Another thing I had experienced as a result of all of this was a dissociative disorder. I started to disconnect myself from my memories, people, and everything around me. Nothing felt real to me and no one mattered to me anymore. Like making new friends was hard because even though people still continue to get close to me, I was so disinterested in being anything to anyone anymore. Like I couldn't get close to people. I never wanted to be that person to anyone ever again. Like this person was the closest person to ever 
know me and they absolutely annihilated me. Like I have pieces of my memory that are just like gone and I had lost all hope in people. And I think that's what really tripped me out the most because I was always all about people. But after all of that, I was just like a shell of my former self. I remember it didn't really start to hit me how bad this detachment was until like November of 2021 when I spent Thanksgiving at my aunt's house in Virginia. And they showed me footage of me and my family as a kid that I had never seen before. And I remember sitting there watching myself as a little kid and it was the most surreal out of body experience. I was processing myself thinking I'm human. I was real. I had a family and I was full of life. And I was starting to get emotional because I was remembering what felt like someone else's memories. And oftentimes in my life, I would split myself into two personalities, you know, the real me and then the professional me. And I think the reason why I've been able to progress so much in my life looking unharmed was because the professional side of me took over and thrived. But the personal side of me either died or was stuck in McAllen. And you know, I learned that most people who have a traumatic event are usually stuck in the moment that the event occurred. But throughout all of this, I was still able to do so much. And I think that was mostly due to the fact that I knew my purpose and had faith in God. I think knowing your purpose in life is what really grounds you through times of distress because I knew that God was still somehow going to take everything messed up and use it for his glory. And he did. But it was just hard because even though I kept doing things in my life, like meeting new people, having a ton of new life experiences and hustling to make my music happen, and to grow my business, there was always this sadness that lingered and it always felt like a thorn in my flesh. You know, my mom and my sister and I think probably a few other people in my life always wondered why I was so good to this kid. Like there were times when he needed gas money and I would spot him or, or there was this one time where he needed to get new tires and I paid for all four tires, which, you know, obviously he paid me back for. But these were things that were so out of character for me to my family and they never would expect me to be like this. And they would always wonder why I was a different person than the one that they knew. And it was so hard to explain until one day I realized why when I was in Guatemala spending Christmas with my cousins. See, growing up, my family often accused me of being self-involved, never wanting to help anyone and not being family oriented. But when I was in Guatemala, I found myself so easily doing things around the house by waking up in the morning and going downstairs to wash the dishes or waking up in the morning to cook breakfast for everyone. Like, like these were things you would never catch me doing in my home around my family. And I knew that if they were ever to find out, I would never hear the end of it. But why did I do it? I realized that when I feel loved, I feel safe. And when I feel safe, it brings out the real me. And the real me is someone who has a lot of love to give and wants to do good things like serve others. The reason why my family never saw me do these things was because I never felt safe in my home. They never made me feel safe. And as a result, I never felt like I could be myself. But I realized I would be this way to anyone that actually showed me real love and made me feel safe enough to be myself and to be this loving person. So when it came to this friend of mine, I would say he was the first person that I was able to be this person with. Like it was so easy to be loving to this person. And that's why I loved having him in my life because he brought out a person in me that I loved being. I loved being someone's big brother and I loved that he looked up to me and came to me with all of his problems. And I loved feeling needed and like I was a part of someone's life because I never had that before. I have a lot of love to give, but no one in my life ever wanted it or no one in my life knew how to create a safe enough environment for me where it could naturally come out. And that's honestly a testament to how loving a person he was at the time too. It was on this trip in Guatemala when it had finally hit me that everything I grew up around being desensitized by was actually abuse. I realized that my mom had abused us all growing up and that it actually severely impacted me. And it was evident by how comforted I was whenever I was around my cousins. I felt like I actually had family. My mom didn't want me to get close to family on her side or my dad's side. And so for most of my life, I was isolated with no cousins, aunts, uncles, or anyone. It was just us, our immediate family, and it was super dysfunctional and chaotic. After 2019, a lot of my extended family were older. And because I had already reestablished a connection with them on my own, I was able to build on this relationship during this time. On top of that, my mom resented me so much for having a relationship with her family because of her own issues. So I encountered so much resistance, fights, and arguments with her all because I was trying to have some sense of family in my life. But this discovery about my upbringing changed a lot about how I viewed my mother. So 
when I got back home in 2021, you know, I was still living at home paying for rent, but I really wasn't on talking terms with my mom for about two years until I moved out. Among the multitude of things that she would say and do, one of the things that she did, which I considered probably like the worst, was use what happened to me in Texas to hurt me whenever she wanted to hurt me. She would say things like, see, this is why no one likes you. That's why you got beat up in Texas. That's why that kid in Texas punched you. And the arguments would never have anything to do about what happened in Texas, but she knew where to go to hurt me. But that's how effed up she is, you know, to use my trauma and weaponize it against me. And this happened several times over the last three years. And that's why it was funny reading the hate messages that these people sent me, because when you're in my situation and you have your own mother saying the most hurtful, evil things to her own child, you become pretty impenetrable. So the Texas event led me to understand my anxiety. Learning about my anxiety forced me to confront my childhood and my childhood made me realize that my mom abused us and realizing that my mom abused us led me to distance myself from having a relationship with my mother. This is why it's so hard to just dismiss what happened in McAllen and not talk about it because it opened up a lot of crap in my life that definitely was necessary, but you know, hard. Throughout this time, my relationship with God really grew. You know, after Too Late was released, I had a lot of kids messaging me on social media and I felt like I saw my friend in a lot of them. A lot of these kids had the same influences. They were all broken, lost kids with no guidance or directions, but they also like talked like him. Like the random things that he used to always like talk to me about and share with me is like what they would say. I hated it because I would see him in all of these like interactions and they just made me miss him. But for whatever reason, they were drawn to me and I took that role seriously. You know, I believe God used this time to really narrow down on what my purpose is in life and what he wants me to do. And very simply, what I believe I'm called to do is to invade the culture and turn young men into kings. I believe that I'm meant to lead a generation of boys who will become the most loving, fearless, wise, honorable, and powerful men. And I believe that God needed to use the closest person to me to create motivation. I think I'm meant to give people another option. You know, after everything went down in McAllen, I hated social media. I hated everything about the influencer culture. I hated TikTok and I blamed it for the reason why my friend became what he became. And I saw the negative impact it was having in the culture among young males everywhere. Like I remember my friend Danny, who he was when I had met him and the things that he would talk about. If you were to compare that to who he is today, you'd be blown away. Like Danny snapped out of that trance super quick to get his life together. And now, I know he's going to be incredibly successful in his life. But I had so much resentment towards social media, especially after hearing that in May of 2020, my friend ended up getting discovered off of TikTok by Next Models and then getting signed to a modeling agency. One day my friend Alex randomly texted me saying that this kid got signed. And then that was the first time I actually had gone on his Instagram to see what had actually been going on in his life. And I was actually really happy for him because I knew that this is what he was wanting. But I felt sad because I was like, man, like I'm supposed to be there celebrating with you, bro. Like not only did I tell you to do all of this one year earlier, but I was always rooting for this moment. So it was just like another reminder as to why I just never wanted to see what he was up to because it would just always make me so sad. But also I knew that it was going to make him think even more highly of himself now. I just felt like he was going to turn into even worse of a person. And luckily I wasn't around to find out. But I think this is the life that most kids in America want. You know, they think they're defined by followers and social media. And that's what ended up sickening me about the whole thing, even when I reflect on my own behavior and how I would portray myself on social media. And that's basically what my song Pretty Boy Famous is about. You know, it was me making fun of myself and the culture because that's what I spent most of my 20s being around. And that's why I really valued being around my friend Danny because he's just not about that at all. And he's like the complete opposite of this kid from McAllen, you know, for all of the good reasons. Danny came into my life at a point where I had given up on people, where I rejected my purpose because of this kid from McAllen. You know, but witnessing the growth and maturity in Danny, you know, in the last two and a half years that I've known him. And more importantly, seeing Danny start to value loving people as a result of our friendship was what restored my hope in people. Because that's what this is all about. If I could summarize this whole entire story about me and this kid from McAllen into one word, it would be love. And that's why it's so funny the things that they kept saying, the hate messages, like, you're so obsessed with him. You were crying over another man. You built your entire career off of him. You're like a crazy ex-girlfriend. Like, I knew exactly what they were trying to do. They were trying to emasculate me and trying to reduce everything into some type of gay love obsession. And the thing for me is that I'm just like, what are you doing, bro? 
you know that this isn't true so why do you keep trying to pervert this and why does it feel like you want that to be what the story is even though you know it's not i think the objective was to try to make me stop caring or something but that's the thing is that loving people is my power it's rooted into every single thing that i do but everything that i've learned from this was the importance of why i have to continue to love this whole event showed me the importance of a friend like me in other people's lives because i'm rare like i truly believe that if the world had a friend like me that there wouldn't be suicides mass shootings drug addictions depression and chaos and so for those people to try to reduce the integrity of my friendship is the most lazy stupid deflection of reality and truth but honestly it's also what most males will customarily do when they feel inferior to this type of power real power so for them to try to twist it and pervert it to make me feel insecure because i care who are you kidding bro sometime around january of 2021 i discovered that this kid also blocked me on venmo and i don't even bother looking for this stuff i just learned of it by putting two and two together you know on venmo you could search and see people he would regularly send money to and so i saw one day like oh his name no longer appears i wonder why that's weird i didn't know you could delete it because i think i had tried to delete his name and you just couldn't right so i decided to type up his name and i was completely blocked and so i thought well that's weird it's been over a year since everything happened like why would you block me on venmo anyway this prompted me to go check to see if he had found found my new Instagram, which I learned that he did because he blocked my new Instagram. And so my immediate thought was like, man, he still hates me and he doesn't even know the full story. Like it started to get to me because all I wanted for the last year and a half was the opportunity to talk to him about everything and he refused to ever let that happen. So then I started having the dreams again and I was so distressed and I had no one really to talk to about any of this until one day I decided that I really should probably just try talking to my friend Alex, who was our only mutual friend. My plan was to open up to Alex about how every everything was affecting me and try to get him to facilitate an opportunity for me to send this kid a message like the message that I've been trying to communicate to him over the last year and a half and in my dreams and all that. So me and Alex met up one time in my studio and I just remember being so terrified to talk to him about it, you know? Why? Because I think I was afraid he was gonna say like, man, you're still stuck on the situation, you gotta move on and just like dismiss my feelings and how hard it's been on me. I felt like I was going to annoy him or burden him with this situation. So I was just scared that somehow I would get hurt by being this vulnerable about the situation because the truth was I wasn't healed and it was still affecting me and to my surprise Alex heard me out and he understood me and he did something that I will never forget that no one has ever done for me he intervened when I asked him if he could talk to this kid on my behalf so that I could send him a message and get closure because it was affecting my mental health I didn't know if he was gonna take it seriously or not right like I didn't know what he was gonna do but he had called him right after he left from our conversation and talked to him and a couple of hours later he told me that the kid agreed for me to text him and to get closure from all of this and I was just like so overwhelmed because I never thought this was gonna happen especially as fast as it did. Alex told me that he was gonna text me and I made sure to give him my number because I was sure that he didn't have it anymore and this was the moment that I had been waiting for for such a long time. So later that day I spent hours writing out everything I possibly could about the situation and what went down and taking responsibility for my part and also acknowledging the truth as to why everything went down. You know my hope was that he would understand that I didn't rat him out to his mom out of vengeance or malice but out of concern and because I promised that I would be there to protect him in a moment just like that. I had hoped that maybe he would see me and not hate me for what I did but could understand me and forgive me. But I mean this was the first time we were ever going to talk directly to each other after over a year since everything went down and there was nothing more important to me at that time than this and it was so I could find my peace again. So then the evening comes and he texts me a long paragraph and after reading what he said to me i was like this is not at all how i wanted this to go i should warn you that there is no part of this entire story that ever gets better it just will continue to get worse and worse for me <laughs> anyway i had told alex that all i wanted was for me to send him a text message with everything i'd been trying to say and that was it like i didn't need this dude to respond
on. I didn't need it to be a conversation. I wasn't looking for an apology, nothing. I just wanted to send a message and that was it. That's all I wanted. His message was basically him trying to show me that he wasn't mad at me and that he doesn't hate me and he wasn't affected by what happened and I shouldn't be so hung up on a situation that wasn't really that big of a deal. And sorry if I ever hurt you, but you know, you're strong and you'll get through it. And then he said, please don't send me a long paragraph text message back. Mind you, my anxiety was through the roof and I had this whole thing written out already. So I responded to him and I was like, I didn't need you to send me anything. I only wanted to send you this message and that was it. So the next text is gonna be the last message I'll ever send you. You can decide to read it or not. That's it, goodbye. Then I copied and pasted to him the message that I wrote. I was like relieved. I was like, cool, this is all I wanted to get out of this, whatever. His message to me didn't mean anything. But was it done? No. He texted me back saying, LOL, I'm not gonna read all that. Good luck in life. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, this kid is the most bitchiest man I've ever known. Like, could you imagine how much that cut me inside? I was so hurt because all I've been wanting to say were these words. And it was like, he knew what I was trying to do since everything that went down. And he'd been intentionally making it impossible for me. Oh my God. You know, I responded, you didn't have to tell me you weren't going to read it. You could have just not read it. And then he was like, sorry, but I don't have time to read all that. And then I realized that all he was trying to do was hurt me. You know, up until I found out he blocked me, I just assumed that he'd forgotten about me. And any of the falling outs I've had with people that I used to be close with, I always just assumed that they just like would forget about me and that they would be indifferent towards me. So when I learned he blocked me on Instagram and even on Venmo, and then a month later was telling me that what had happened wasn't that big of a deal and that it was basically just a forgettable moment to him and that he doesn't hate me and isn't mad at me. I was like, huh? If that was the case, you wouldn't have blocked me on Venmo and you wouldn't have blocked me on Instagram. Those are like really hostile things that someone does because they feel some type of way about somebody. But after this had happened, I realized you're still mad about what happened and you're trying to hurt me back for it. Like that was all he took this opportunity to do was to hurt me back. After this, I realized that the only way he'd ever come around is after a monumentally humbling life experience. I was like, man, God is going to have to utterly level this kid if he's ever going to have a chance at being redeemed. But it freed me. What that moment at least revealed to me was that he did in fact care about what happened in McAllen and that it also affected him. You know, at this point, I've pretty much learned that he means the exact opposite of whatever he says when he is hiding behind this exterior of, I don't care, I'm above it all, because that's exactly how I used to be when I was a kid. So it was obvious that he still hated me, but at that point, I did everything I could to try to fix things and it was beyond me. The next couple of days I felt so relieved you know I felt like I was a brand new person that this mental cloud that had been suffocating had finally been lifted and I was able to re-engage with my friends again and I was able to go back to the gym to get back in shape and I was motivated to continue to grow my business and I honestly felt alive again and for the rest of the year I moved on to other projects and things and I thought that that would be the end of it and you know it wasn't like always all love on my part you know I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I was the best thing ever to enter this person's life and I did no wrong and I'm above reproach or anything like that like of course I had my flaws and I'm sure that I did things that made him upset or whatever throughout the point of our friendship and stuff but even in the aftermath I mean there were days where I hated this person and what they did to me because none of it was fair but I think that's something you learn about forgiveness is that it's something you do on the daily you don't just wake up and forgive someone and then that's it I mean maybe for some things you can but when it comes to an injustice that's been done to you it's a lot different and when you're trying to forgive someone that violated you and caused an injustice, you know, you're looking at having to forgive them every single time they pop in your head, you know, and I think over time it got easier for me because I was right about everything. Throughout 2021, I kept hearing about this kid's modeling career and how he wasn't getting booked and how desperate he was for just one modeling job. And I was told he was working at some hotel in McAllen and that he had dropped out of college and he was still living at home. And that's the thing is that he had a misconception of like, okay, you, you have a lot of followers, you got signed to a modeling agency, now that's gonna mean that your career is gonna blossom and you're gonna become big and huge and make money and you're gonna be able to live off of this stuff. And the thing is, is that he wasn't able to and most people aren't, like, which is why I always try to teach him to develop a skill that he can make money off of. Hearing about his struggle, hearing of probably the fact that he was incredibly disappointed with the outcome of actually what it looks like to be a signed model with the top modeling agency, you know? This is what was sad is that even after all that time that he was still incapable 
example of being on his own independent because his mom castrated him. So he depends on everyone around him to give him advice, to tell him what he needs to be doing, especially when he feels lost. And I hated hearing these things because no matter how effed up he was to me, he still and will forever be like a little brother to me. And I hated knowing that he was so desperate because that was one of the things that I tell him never to be. You know, I told him, don't be desperate because you'll be stupid. But I can only imagine what he would be dealing with. You know, like he dropped out of college twice, moved back to the town he hated. And even though he blew up on TikTok and got signed to a modeling agency, it's not going how he expected it to go. So I can imagine the internal crisis he was dealing with that was making him so desperate. And that was why I didn't want to know anything. You know, I didn't want to talk about him, hear about him or know anything because all it was going to do was make me worry and then make me sad. Like I told Alex, bro, just don't tell me anything unless he's dying in danger or he died. Like, don't tell me anything about him. I do not want to know anything. And after that, all I did was just pray for this kid like endlessly. For the rest of the year, I was focused on growing my photography business, paying off my debts, dealing with my mother and learning how to market my music and grow my fan base. Then in September of 2021, a hate account emerged out of nowhere called Brandon Andre's Gay Lover. They had been posting content of mine, editing videos to make me say weird stuff and kept on saying that they were my secret lover. At first, I didn't think anything of it. I just thought it was some random hater who had a lot of time on their hands. They kept following my followers and the people I followed who were mostly my friends and family, messaging them, basically trashing me. I had friends who kept messaging me, telling me that this page had been messaging them and I was just telling them to block and report them. But then they posted a video of mine from my YouTube channel that I had privated the year prior. And I realized that these people had to have been following me for over a year in order for them to have saved this video. So then I realized it wasn't a fan or anyone that had been following me recently. And as they kept following people in my life, my brother had texted me saying that he was talking to them, which pissed me off so much because I knew that whoever these people were, that they were trying to pierce my inner circle to get to me. And here was my brother giving them the time of day. And so I was furious with him because I told him to block them and he didn't listen and he engaged with them. So he sent me screenshots saying that they were pretending to be my friend. They were giving hints and I was trying to figure out if what they were saying was information that you could gather by watching my YouTube videos. And you know, they mentioned hiking, which you could see us do in my vlogs. They mentioned a photo shoot, which is what you would see us do. And they mentioned a night in Texas, which I think was referencing the events. So I was just trying to conclude that they were just a random hater, not someone who I personally knew who had a grudge against me. But then they used his first, middle, and last name initials. And that's when I was like, wait, who in the world could this be? Because I've never used his name in any of my content at all. So where were these people able to find out his name, let alone his entire first, middle, and last name? Like, I didn't think at all that it could be him because up until this point, his entire MO was to appear like he didn't care and he was indifferent. So I tried to think of who could be doing this and he wasn't even on my list. So I was trying to think who out there could figure out his name and who would know to use his name to hit a really sensitive subject for me. But they had an entire attack plan where they kept creating content, posting and trying to get under my skin and it worked. I just tried to ignore it and hope the lack of attention would make it blow over. I kept trying to give reasons as to why it couldn't actually be this friend of mine, even though I knew deep down that it was something he was entirely capable of doing. But like, why? Why would he be doing this? When I got back from Virginia, I was focused on my upcoming release, Pretty Boy Famous. I was about to drop right around my birthday in October. You know, days leading up to that release, I had a new fan page that followed me. And at this point, I was on high alert and I naturally don't trust people who don't have real Instagram profiles. Like I like to talk to real people. So this fan page appears and messages me telling me that they're a 13 year old girl who's a fan of mine. And when I asked her to follow me from like a real account, she was like, my mom won't let me have one. And so I dropped my song Pretty Boy Famous, which ended up being a dud. I think two days later, the same fan page changes their username to Pretty Boy Anus and then posts on their feed. Brandon, you're 29 years old, still living with your mom, thinking you're famous. You're delusional. Your music obviously sucks. Stick to taking pictures. And I felt like, okay, if this is him and he's hiding behind his brother, his friends, whatever, then this must be the only way I'll ever actually be able to talk about what happened. So I might as well let them air out everything they have to say and just be done with it. So I let them talk and throw their speculations. They were saying that I'm obsessed and I built my entire music career off of this person, which I thought was like the weirdest and funniest thing ever too, because if you're new to my music or if you don't actually know me or know what these songs are about, you're never gonna think this person is making music based around one person. The only person who would think that is him and his brother. And so the more they kept talking, the more it kept pointing back to both of them. Like this kid would always use capital ha 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 as a way to like laugh and mock something. 
and that's exactly what they would do. Another thing that they said was that I was trying to copy him and steal his cloud and one up him with my life. And I thought I refuse to even go on this kid's social media. So why would I be trying to copy him? And like, what would I be copying him for? Because I don't even know what's going on in his life. And then when I told them that I had only gone on this kid's Instagram like twice in the last two years, they switched it up and said that something was wrong with me because I couldn't even go on his Instagram and that I was exhibiting behaviors that were either attractions or that I was codependent. I was already under the belief that they had a twisted perception of what happened in McAllen, right? Everything else they were inventing in their heads wasn't going to surprise me. And the thing was that he used to do this all of the time. Like when we were friends, he would always take the things I do and try to interpret them differently. And I hate when people do that, especially because I'm always clear about why I do things. Like I'm the type of person where I say what I mean and mean what I say. And that's something that most leaders naturally do because if you're going to teach someone and lead someone, guess what? They're going to ask why. And so you always have to have an explanation. That was the whole reason why I was trying to talk to him because I wanted him to have the right explanation behind the choices that I made. So seeing how hard they were reaching for an explanation that would make me out to be crazy was not surprising at all. But it was also the reason that it made it so obvious that it had to be him and his brother behind these hate accounts. I felt like he kept projecting his inner feelings starting with like the obsession accusation. You know, you're out here saying I'm obsessed, but you're creating hate pages of me. Like, not to mention that I discovered that they had been stalking me for more than a year. I found out that this account that I started seeing around like February of 2021 would always be watching my stories and voting on the negative options for my polls. This same account after I blocked Pretty Boy Anus went on all of these business accounts that I had leaving me hate comments. And so that's when I realized that all three of these accounts were connected and they had been watching me for the entire year. But I'm the obsessed one who's trying to compete with him. The other thing that convinced me that it was them was because they said this. You act like he doesn't have friends that love him. Like you're the only one who somehow loved him. You know, if you're a stranger or a random troll, why would you say this? Like this is some deeply profound stuff that only someone who knew the story could say. But the only reason why they would say that is if they're projecting because they went on to say that I think I'm Jesus or something and that I have a savior complex. That sounds like something he tried to assess wrongly based upon everything that went down to McAllen. Plus again, these are really deep sentiments that no one could just pluck off of a YouTube video. But also these people knew how to identify my sister by saying that my song did so bad that I asked my sister to repost it on Instagram. And my sister has a different last name than me on Instagram. So how could a random stranger even know that she was my sister and that we were related? And on top of that, they knew I still lived with my mom specifically, which means they know my parents were divorced and they know what my room looked like and they know that my room was in my mom's house. How could a stranger know that? I never discussed that. I mean, look, I don't have a 100% guarantee that it was him or his people. I mean, it seems obvious for a list of reasons why it could be, but there's always a possibility that it could just be someone else and it could just be really, really ironic. But because I think I know him so well, this is my theory as to the most logical explanation why I think he did this. Number one, I made a music video about our falling out that came out in February of 2020. Let's assume he watched it because my friend Alex was in it and he posted it several times on Instagram for everyone to see and they were still following each other. But let's just assume that he watched it and was affected by it. So that's motive number one. Number two, in March of 2020, I released a backstory about the music video where I opened up specifically about what happened to me during this time period, including my story about what happened to McCallan. His email inbox blows up from different people. I don't blame him for thinking that I expose his identity to my followers. So he gets together with his brother and his cousins who already know about me and what happened between him and I. And because they're all bored kids with no lives, probably drooling over the drama, thinking, Brandon Andre's talking about me to all of his followers. And so they leave hate comments on this video where this kid is telling his brother and his cousins to try to hurt me and get back at me. Three, then in July of 2020, I get back from Miami and I make a new Instagram account. Four, in January of 2021, he finds my new Instagram account and then blocks me for whatever reason. Five, February of 2021, I'm going to assume assume that because of the whole email thing and the video that I posted on YouTube that they were probably like, oh, Brandon Andre is talking about me. Like he's already exposed me to all his followers. Let's keep tabs on him and see if he continues to talk about me, you know? And I think that's probably the reason why they created the spam account to stalk me and watch my stories because they were just waiting and wanting to see if I was talking about him. Six, again, in February of 2021, we have our first texting conversation post McCallan where he tries to convince me that the McCallan event was meaningless and it didn't affect him and basically tries to hurt 
hurt me by rejecting reading my message to him. And seven, the reason why I think they made these hate pages was because sometime in May or June of 2021, I posted an IGTV video where I put a side by side of the music video for Goodbye and the Goodbye live version. And on the thumbnail cover on the bottom, it was a still of me and my cousin from that video. And on the top, it was a still from the Goodbye music video that had me and my friend. Because if you watch my music video Goodbye, it's all pretty much a montage of different footage of my friends over the last 10 years. Then two posts later, I did the same side by side thing where I posted too late the music video with the characters, Alex and Antonio. And then on the bottom, it was a too late lyric video where it's just me. And so I'm extremely symbolic. It was just a thing that I did for myself. I didn't think anyone would read too much into it, ignored it, whatever. He's never gonna see it anyway, so I don't really care. But what makes the most sense is that they were spying on me off and on because they thought that I was talking about him, right? So I figure around August or September, they were probably snooping on my Instagram and scrolling through the last couple of months and they come across a photo of him in my feed and that's what triggered them. Then if they didn't already watch the music video for Goodbye, then that was going to be the first time that they were going to watch a glimpse of my music video for Goodbye. And yes, he's in this music video along with a multitude of other people. So if they saw this, they were probably thinking, oh my God, Brandon Andre made another song about you. He's talking about you again. He's so obsessed. And like none of these songs were even about him. Like that's what's so weird. It's like Thanos acting like the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe is all about him. No dude, Too Late was written literally to me. It's a letter to me from everyone that never noticed my pain in my life. It was about me and Goodbye was about all of my past friendships and relationships. It wasn't about one single person. I think that if this is the train of thought that they were following, then they probably now have an even bigger motive. And at this point, he would have been like 22 years old. And you're probably thinking like, what kind of 22 year old grown man does something like this, right? Well, he couldn't do it alone. This kid has way too much pride to do this on his own. But if his little brother, cousins, and friends are the ones encouraging him, then of course he's going to feel empowered to do it. He's not going to feel like this is weird or creepy because he's technically not the one behind it. It's his entire support group. Like, I think that's how they justify the absolute insanity of what they did. Plus, he did this before. He hid behind his friends in the past in situations where we got into an argument. He told me one time that it was his friends from Bakersfield who was texting me things that he didn't mean to say when I had distanced myself from him briefly in 2018. Then in late 2018, he told his friend to leave a comment on a post of mine on Instagram calling me gay. And then when I confronted him because I knew it was his friend, he was like, yeah, it was just a joke. We were bored at work. And then he did it again on the backstory video on YouTube where he had his brother and his cousins do it. So that's already three examples of him hiding behind people to like attack me. So this is the only thing that makes sense as to why he specifically would be behind this. The only other alternative theory is that he's literally crazy, obsessed, and deranged. So I screen recorded the entire conversation and debated on confronting him via text. And I really didn't want to. I mean, there was absolutely nothing to gain from engaging with him because what was I going to expect? It's like he was going to be like, oh yeah, Brandon, it was me. I was behind all that. No, he would look crazy. And it was obvious that he would deny it and say he was behind it. So it was like useless to even confront him about it. So I put it off until I talked about it with a friend of mine who encouraged me for whatever reason to text him. Like this text that I sent him was basically like, bro, like what is wrong with you? Like none of what you're saying is true. You know this. It's clearly reflective of you being unhappy, bitter, and miserable. And all of this does is prove that I was right about everything that I warned you about, but you still have the ability to turn things around you know that's how i always end things with this kid trying to give him a sliver of hope because i still you know wanted to believe that things could be different from him and what was his response well of course he denied it but he also denied it giving me clues that made it even more obvious that it was him the first thing he said is his favorite line i'm not going to read all that he went on to say that someone a couple of months back messaged him saying to see something about me and he said that he thought it was me who was behind that account first of all the account was called brandon andre's gay lover there's no chance in hell that he would ever think that it would be me sending him a message from that account. First of all, I make high quality music videos and everything I do is of the uttermost professional, top tier, expensive ass sounding and looking content around. And he knows that. So he would never believe that I would be behind an account like that. So for him to say, oh, I thought it was you is absolute bullshit. But I get why he said it. Oh, they also messaged me. Therefore, it couldn't have been me. It's the easiest way to dismiss himself as a suspect. Then the other thing that was out of character for him was he actually showed sympathy saying i'm really sorry that you're going through that that's pretty effed up right because now he's going to be sympathetic to me but not any of the times previous to this when i was really looking for that sympathy to be able to heal from what happened between us just to talk to him and then he said i don't even know how they knew my name and that really creeps me out which is so funny to me because that's also what i was wondering how do they know his name you know when people
people who are trying to cover up a lie, but then they made a mistake and then they call out the mistake as a means to get everyone to think that they're genius for discovering that mistake. And if they're the suspects, well, why would the suspect call out their own mistake, right? They couldn't be the suspect because they call out the mistake. And so it's like a deflection tactic to make people not suspicious about them. Those were the vibes that I was getting from that comment. On top of that, if these people who made these hate pages knew his identity and knew his Instagram, why then when they were posting content, didn't they ever publicly use his name on those pages? Like if they were really trying to piss me off and get under my skin and they knew his name and how it would be a trigger for me, wouldn't they have put it on their bio or in the captions of their posts? Wouldn't they have done everything possible to expose this person's name publicly if they're out there claiming that he's my secret lover? For some reason, they only waited to be in my DMs in order to bring up his name. Also, I think that when they were talking to my brother, they thought that I was with him and we were trying to figure out who it was because they were talking to him as if I was using his account saying, you know who I am, Brandon. But I was across the country and I told everyone to block them and specifically not to engage with them. And again, if I think that this entire thing is him projecting, then I believe he would think that because that's exactly what he was doing with his brother. They were together talking crap about me behind these hate pages. But I'll ask you guys, why do you think that they only used his name privately and only in DMs directly with me and not publicly? It seems to me that their entire motive was just to be able to DM me, that they had something that they really wanted me to hear. And that's not what a random troll does, but that's what someone who's butthurt does. Then I asked him, well, weren't you behind the comments from the backstory of my video on YouTube? And he still didn't take direct responsibility. Instead, he said that was my brother and my cousins who did it in front of me. He didn't say, yeah, that was us and take responsibility. Instead, he tried to make it seem like it wasn't him so he could avoid taking responsibility. But what was ironic was when he said, who even has the time to do something like this? Like right after admitting that he literally did something like this just the year prior to this. You know, it's one thing to say like, hey man, I can see how it totally looks like I was behind this because I did something like this to you a long time ago, but it really was not me at all. Like at least you're trying to take responsibility for your past actions and character because you're self-aware enough to see how it clearly points to you. But no, instead he denies it, always evading responsibility and accountability. Like even if he were to say, well, it wasn't my idea to leave the hate comments on YouTube, that was them. Okay, bro, you still gave them information about me. You still showed them the video that I had sent to you so clearly you were involved in all of it he also said you didn't hurt me and i don't have anything against you anymore and i'm living a really happy life first of all the last interaction alone was a massive indication that you were really hurt because if you weren't hurt then you would have never texted me back i'm not reading all of that you would have just never read it that's what indifference really looks like but he said that because he wanted to hurt me back because that's what someone does when they still care about something so for him to say that one of the biggest crazy events that transpired in his home in front of his mom that it didn't hurt him is a bald-faced lie secondly no one who is happy needs to tell someone they're happy. Again, if I really did not care about someone and they told me that I was miserable and unhappy, I would literally like not care at all. Like I wouldn't feel the need to respond to them because that's how indifferent I am to their opinion of me. But of course it all makes sense as to why he would say that because all of this is rooted in me warning him about making life decisions that would ruin his life that he ended up doing and then subsequently live a life where he's stuck in McAllen. So of course I'm gonna be the person he's going to try to prove wrong and to try to convince that he's happy. But happy people, don't hurt people or hate people. And since we never actually had a mature adult conversation about what happened, it's because he never matured and grew up, which means he still thinks and acts like a kid. So of course I expect him to be influenced by his kid cousins and brother. Then what I think really gave it away was the last thing he said to me, which was stop hitting me up. Every time you do, it's some weird shit. Please just leave me alone. Like seriously. What? When I read that message, I was like flabbergasted. I was just like, are you kidding me? Like he literally managed to make himself a victim in this interaction. Mind you, the last interaction we had was when he texted me. So the fact that he said, stop hitting me up as if I was texting him all the time, bro, the way he twists and flips things around to paint this false reality. And what's crazy to know is that he's literally like me if I was godless. Like he has his brother and his cousins and he leads them to do evil things. I have my my cousins and nephews and I leave them to do godly things like I would never let my family or friends on my behalf ever attack him like this at all like I teach my family to love not this he wants to grow following on social media because he wants to be worshipped I want to grow an audience for my music because I have something that I want to give people that I believe they need people follow him and look up to him for vanity reasons people follow me and look up to me because they see the power of God in me he attracts people because of a false image I attract people because of my personality and how real I am he's insecure I'm confident he dreams ideas 
is and I get them done. I look at him and I see what my life would look like if I was en route to hell. There is no God in his heart and I don't know what exactly happened to him to make him become this way, but at least I've learned this, that if I still love him after everything he's put me through, that God has even more love for him than I do. And so my hope is in God still being able to redeem him, but after all of this, I fully expected to never hear from him or the people behind the hate pages ever again. In fact, I wagered that if it was him and his brother, then I wouldn't ever see these hate pages again. Why? Because they said everything they wanted to say. So what more can they do? If they were just random trolls, they would still be at it because it wouldn't be personal. It would be just to cause chaos. But that's when I took in everything and thought, I don't know why you still hate me. Like, seriously. I thought we talked. You said you weren't mad at me. It didn't mean anything. Yet here you are making hate pages of me on Instagram. So I was like, you know what? You think that these songs are about you? Well, they're not. But guess what? Now I'm going to make a song about you. And that was the entire premise behind I don't know why you still hate me. It was to placate to their statement of being obsessed. Then that morphed into what would be the most extreme thing I could do to take their messages and their hate and make a joke out of it. And it was to fly back down to McAllen and film the entire music video of me taking over their town. And boy, was that so much fun. As I said before, every time I try to communicate something with this kid, it was always with like a punch and like a, hey, I don't hate you though. You know, I know how sensitive this kid is and I could literally destroy him with just my words. But the thing is, even after everything he's done to me, I just still didn't have it in me to hurt him. That's the thing, like the entire music video wasn't me trying to hurt him. It was more like, bro, you're literally so funny. Like, I think you're forgetting who it is that you're dealing with here. And, and like, no one does this. Who flies down to their cyberbully's hometown and stage a takeover? Like, bro, I'm wild. Like, it's crazy. But then it makes sense too when you know the whole story, you know? It makes sense as to why it was important for me to go down there and heal from my trauma. It makes sense why I still say in the music video that I'm still gonna love this person. The whole point of this music video and song was to show power, you know, real power. Real power is to have evil come up against you to try to invade your spirit and take you over and swallow you whole, but lose. I could have destroyed this kid the day everything went down to McAllen. I could have called the cops and pressed charges on him for laying hands on me. I could have actually exposed his name and what he did and sent those messages directly to his modeling agency and get all my fans to write his agency emails so that they would drop him. I could expose him as a bully on TikTok and tell everyone what his Instagram and TikTok name is so that he could get canceled. I have power to destroy him instantly if I really wanted to, but I don't want to. I just want him to stop being lost. I just know that all of this still wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to make me stop being his big bro, and it wasn't enough to stop loving him. I still believe in the commitment I made to him that night in my car in front of his place in Bakersfield. And if anything, this entire story is about me never wavering from that commitment. To be there for him, to look out for him, and to remind him of who he once used to be. You know, that night in my car in front of his house, when he was opening up to me about everything that he was going through and you know i'd asked him bro who do you want to be like what kind of man do you want to be and he was like i want to be a man of god you know because he was struggling with being pulled back and forth between the world and the church and stuff but he was like i want to be a man of god and i said okay bro say it He's like i want to be a man of god i'm like believe it bro i want to be a man of god i want to be a man of god and i was like okay bro anytime you're ever in this darkness again i'm going to remind you of what you said today on this date and i said i promise you that i will always be there for you to see that through and that was the commitment that i made and that was the worst thing that i could ever do because look at me now talking about this shit. oh my god but i i meant that for sure i meant that and nothing's changed for me i'm opening up about this because i think people need to see what love really looks like i think people need to see what friendship really looks like and i think people need to see what power really looks like my relationship with god is the sole reason i was able to survive all of this you know he's given me the power to overcome evil and i'm still doing everything i ever wanted to do in my life you know i have the apartment i've always dreamed of my businesses are taking off and i'm making more money than i ever have and i'm still making music like i always dreamed I would. On top of that, I got people that love me, people who believe in me and who got my back. You know, I'm always going to be sad that my little bro isn't here with me enjoying all of the success with me. I'm always going to be sad that, you know, he hasn't been a part of my life and it's always going to hurt. You know, there's always going to be that pain, knowing what things could have been and knowing that they just 
aren't. And I think that the thing that hurt me the most about all of this wasn't what happened in McAllen. It wasn't about how he kept shutting down an opportunity to discuss the event, and it wasn't that he created hate pages that cyberbullied me. The thing that hurt me the most that he did was knowing that at one point in my life, he was the closest person to me. And he watched as I did pretty incredible things with my life. He saw me speak my plans into existence and actually make my dreams a reality. He saw as I built community and how I loved other people. You know, he saw how I overcame hardship and was fearless in the face of adversity. He was a firsthand witness to God's power in my life. And instead of taking everything he saw me do to apply to his life to be a successful, God-fearing, absolute top G king, he became a loser. That was the worst thing he could do to me. He chose to lose over and over and over and I couldn't believe it. He became the antithesis to everything I ever stood for. He had the choice to have a completely different future, a better future. Like, you don't get friends like me in life. You really don't. Like I know I'm special and I used to think that people would forget about me whenever they would leave my life. Until recently, I had several people from my past come back into my life and I realized that why did I ever think I was such a forgettable person when the reality is that you can never forget about me. I'm not someone people just forget. I'm someone people will always remember. And you can't pretend my friendship was disposable because it's not. I've seen how I've impacted people's lives because I really am one of the few people who actually mean it when I say I love my friends. And you know, I think it's easy to look at the situation and think maybe he was just using you all of that time and your friendship was never mutual. Well, no, none of my friendships have ever been mutual, but that's the point. I'm always gonna love people more than they will ever be able to love me because God loves me more than I could ever love him. And as easy as that would be to believe that he was just using me, you know, he would have been really bad at that because he never did anything with any of the opportunities that I ever presented him. But I know that this dude has to, on some level, still have love for me deep down in his dark, twisted, evil heart. Like, he knew that I cared about him and he knew that was real. And that's just too valuable in this life to ever forget. And knowing him, I know that he's going to try extremely hard to pretend like he doesn't care about me and doesn't care about this friendship like it was a blimp in his life, that it was meaningless to him. But let me tell you something. When he was carless and was living in Bakersfield, that kid several times literally took the Greyhound bus all the way down from Bakersfield just because he wanted to spend time with me. And if you know anything about the Greyhound bus line, like that is just something that no one ever chooses to do. But he did it more than once. Why? Because I'm awesome, bro. <laughs> Every experience he ever had with me was fun, was valuable, was good. And there was only one day where that wasn't true. I know that he loved his big bro, but this experience showed me something about God that I could never forget. You know, here I am so angry at him, not for what he did to me, because I forgave him for that like three days later after the event, but I'm so angry because I couldn't understand why he chose to lose in this life. And it's like a scene in the movie where you see this character who had all the means to save themselves and then they end up dying in the most stupid way and you're just like yelling at them because you're just like, bro, the lifesaver was right there. Why would you just let yourself die when you didn't have to? The answer was right in front of you and you were just too stupid to see it. That's what this felt like, you know? But then God revealed me this. Brandon, now you get it. Now you understand my love for humanity, that I have so much love to give them and I have plans to give them a better life, a better future, eternity with me to win. And I pursue them day after day, hoping that they would just come to me to receive everything, but they just won't. It was the craziest moment in my life. I saw a glimpse of God through all of this. You know, I'm not perfect, and I'm not even saying I was the perfect friend to him because believe me, I wasn't. I made mistakes through our friendship and I wish I could have handled certain things better, but I still had love for him. But God's love is perfect and he loves him even more than I could ever understand, which means that my heartbreak couldn't even compare to God's heartbreak over him. I felt like I experienced a fraction of the pain that God feels every single day. But it was also kind of comforting to know that as bad as I wanted this kid to be saved, that God wanted him to be saved even more than I did, which meant that God was going to work on him. And the only thing I could do is continue to pray for him. You know, I had a lot of guilt because I questioned whether or not it was my fault he became like this. You know, it was me who he came to LA for, who invited him out to all these functions and events. It was me who introduced him to all these influencers and who helped him try to become a model and influencer. I was never like the typical LA person to do things in a shady way. 
and I always told him, hey, we're in this world, but not of it, in hopes that he would be encouraged to be set apart and not to try to be just like them. But it wasn't my fault. He was already influenced by so many other factors before I ever entered into the picture, and ultimately, he made his choice. And so I realized, too, that even if I never went to McAllen that day, our friendship was never going to last. He and I were so strangely similar in a lot of ways, but we were also so vastly different. I made things happen, and he just wanted things to happen for him. On that principle alone, our friendship would have never lasted. I hope that one day God is able to reach him and save him and redeem him. And that maybe if we weren't able to see each other again here on earth, that he makes it into heaven and I get to be reunited with my brother again. And if you were to ask me, why Brandon, if you claim to be the loving good friend to him that you're claiming to be, why then did he turn against you? Why did he do all these things to you? And I think I perfectly answered that in the second verse of my song when I said, it's easier to blame than to look within. It's the same reason why I think people hate God and blame him for everything bad that occurs in their life, even though most of the time it was because of their own choices. I mean, I don't really know, but I think he probably uses me as a scapegoat for everything bad that has happened in his life since. That or he hates that I was right about everything down to the T. I think that he projects having a lot of hatred towards me, but deep down, he really just hates himself. And I think that a person who hates himself is always going to unleash their wrath and anger onto the person that knows them the most. It's why I think people push away from God and resent him because if they actually got closer to him, then they would have to actually confront themselves and take accountability for their actions. So it's easier for him to hate me than it is for him to love himself. I know some people might be wondering if I know whether or not he's seen this music video and seen what I did, and I don't really know. What I do know though is that last week, a new hate page appeared on the scene, and it's definitely most likely them, and they made plans to take over my hometown of Chino Hills, <laughs> and apparently followed everyone in McAllen who was a part of the music video, as I was told. I thought it was pretty funny because I don't even live there anymore, but if we believe that the original hate pages were him, then this means that this is them, and they did find out about it, and they did see it. And it makes sense too, because it's been two months since it's been out, so it was pretty expected that this would fall on his radar at a certain point. But hey, maybe it isn't him after all. Maybe there really is someone else out there who's crazy obsessed with me and his friendship. I don't even care anymore. Whatever they try to do next, I'm no longer going to give any attention to it. I did what I did, and it's time to move on. And if it ends up being that it really wasn't actually him or his brother being behind all of these hate pages and hate messages, well, oh well. <laughs> I mean, he's still responsible for everything that happened, so tough luck, bro. But thank you to whoever else it could have been because you helped me make peace with a situation that long affected me. You allowed me to turn this messed up situation into a song where I was able to film a dope music video and go back to a place to confront my trauma to get my power back. Like, all of this needed to happen in order for me to finally, once and for all, be set free from all of this. You know, it took me three years to be able to come to this point right here to speak about all of this, especially with a lot of growth and self-reflection and understanding and, and grace. I've learned so much along the way and I feel so much stronger as a person. And I'm so thankful I was able to turn my pain into my purpose. I win and I am always going to win. So that's all I have to say about that. <laughs>